Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Mark Rudolph, Sounds Chief Experience Officer. Thank you very much for joining us on this week's COVID-19 clinical webinar for all clinicians, which is focused on your questions. As always, we'll have some time for live Q&A at the end of the presentation. Also know that your questions are directly driving the content of these webinars, so please keep them coming. You can type the questions in the chat box that's at the bottom of the webinar control panel on your right. Also, we are recording this webinar and we'll send an email to all invitees with a link to the recording as well as links to all of the resources that are mentioned during the presentation. Today, I'm particularly excited that we have Sound's CEO and founder, Dr. Rob Bessler, with us. And so I'm going to turn it over to him for a couple of minutes. Rob? Hey, thanks, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, I'm also very hopeful that lots of people will uh, listen and watch this and follow up because I recognize they're cranking it out, seeing patients all day long or still asleep from working all night last night. So um, I just wanted to get a few minutes on the call to um, virtually and uh, verbally <laughs> thank each and every one of you. The uh, unprecedented times we're in um, is so obvious, uh, but no one knows it better than each and every one of you having to put on PPE and deal with the stress both at work and at home in a way that we've never felt as a society or a um, group of docs, nurse practitioners, PAs, and nurses uh, across the country. I couldn't be more proud to be part of Sound at this point in time. The organization's uh, ability from each and every doc and nurse, practitioner and nurse and, uh, at, on the front line to our entire organization, to the people still going into offices to mail masks out to, to various sites where they need them. Uh, it's just tremendous uh, how we've really stepped up. I'm super proud of the fact that because of our efforts as an organization and each of our um, clinicians entering information in, in this case, extra information into Sound Connect. We're now able to share that with folks at the NIH and various other folks, people that are needing this uh, real-time information for uh, surveillance. Just want to say thank you, and and please, please, please reach out if you or your site need anything, whether it's from a well-being perspective, which we're greatly concerned about uh, in 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 what's going on and the stress it's creating. Um, to whether your site has issues. Um, we want to hear about it. We want to help try to solve it. And the entire organization is really here to support you. So thank you, Mark, for giving me a moment. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks very much, Rob. Really appreciate your taking the time to join us and for your comments. And tying in with Rob's comments, we want to open with a question that's been asked in a number of different forms, which is how is sound supporting frontline clinicians? And some of you have asked this in very specific ways, but some have asked more broadly. And I think that all of us feel that one of the most important things that we can do to support all of you at this time is to provide you with good information. Uh, earlier this morning, <clears throat> Greg Johnson was talking on a meeting about the idea of certainty and what are the things that we can, can know. Um, any amount of information that helps us to give us guidance in the things that we're doing, the decisions that we're making is, is so valuable at a time like this. And we hope to be able to provide you with information that's gonna help you in this way. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to our chief medical officers for our three clinical lanes. Nate Ruck, who is CMO of Sound Emergency Medicine, Greg Johnson, CMO of Sound Hospital Medicine, and Sergio Zanotti, CMO of Sound Critical Care are gonna address some really important questions and issues that will hopefully arm you with information to help you in the work that you're doing. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Rob. And uh, thank you all for what you're doing at the, at the bedside. Really, I mean, um, taking care of patients under these very difficult and unprecedented uh, circumstances. But uh, like Mark said earlier, we are going to go through a series of questions that were submitted throughout the previous webinars. We please ask you to keep sending these uh, questions in as they can inform future topics and areas of concern. <laughs> 
So the first question which I'll take is, what is the best way for me to protect myself from infection while in the hospital? And I think that it's important, I mean, to, to recognize that there are layers of protection that we can, we can add for different situations. And I think that it's unfortunate that because of obviously uh, the anxiety and the angst that the situation of the pandemic has created, that a lot of the focus has been on perhaps the highest level of protections or the uh, highest uh, uh, type of gear, where what we would probably argue is that most people who are getting COVID-19 infections are probably getting them from breakdowns at more lower and simple, simple level situations. And I think that we should always start with the basics. So I think that the first thing that we've emphasized over and over again is the appropriate use of source control. So in patients uh, either who have suspected, proven, or who we might not know in very high prevalent areas, the first step that we should always do is, I mean, put if possible face masks on those patients that immediately decreases the risk of them spent sp spreading droplets to other people, but also up to ourselves. The second, I think, step, which is very, very important, I can't overemphasize, is the uh, appropriate washing of hands of what we call deliberate hand washing uh, frequently and at all times. Um, most of the data would suggest that the most likely way people are getting infected with COVID, uh, with co uh, getting COVID-19 is by introducing droplets that are in their hands, in their eyes, their mouths, their nose, their face. So the better that we can wash our hands and avoid touching our faces, obviously, the more important, I think, uh, the, the greater the impact in decreasing that risk. And that applies for the hospital, but it applies for the community, applies for, for home, and I think it's something that can't be overemphasized. In terms of what we mean by deliberate hand washing, once again, I mean, this is using soap and water for 20 seconds or more, making sure that you really cover every every aspect of your hand, um, the external fa a facet of the index finger, often neglected, in between fingers, often neglected, the thumbs, often neglected, and also the tips of our fingers. And there are great videos out there of what proper hand washing should look like. I would encourage you to really do it in a very deliberate and present way. I also have found that, especially when you're in the hospital, um, washing your hands very deliberately in between patients, obviously, after you, in between donning and doffing your different uh, PPEs, I think is also a good way of kind of bringing things back to center and be a very, very powerful ritual in the days to come at the bedside. The next level of protection would be to use face mask and gowns, and a lot of hospitals are implementing this according to prevalence and all encounters if possible. And this is obviously, I mean, a, a first level protection for patients in whom you might not know or don't think that they might have COVID, but I think it's a, just, a, again, helps us with decreasing the risk. And then really focusing on what we know about COVID-19 is that the main form of transmission from all the data that we have epidemiologically and from clinical trials is through droplets. So proper droplet precautions for these patients, that includes for us as clinicians, the hand washing, use of a gown, use of gloves, use of a face mask and a, a surgical mask and use of a face shield. With proper doffing of these in the right order and washing your hands in between each step so that if there's any self-contamination, you minimize the risk of of getting, I mean, get, uh, getting contaminated. And finally, the last level is for those patients in whom we're performing high risk procedures in terms of aerosolization of droplets, which is a plausible, not proven, plausible way of transmission. I think that the addition of N95s at that moment is gonna be very important. But I think it really goes back to the diligent and deliberate application of these steps and making sure that we use them every single time and that we do it in the best way possible. Thanks, Sergio. So I guess real quickly before I answer this question, I think one other thing you can do to protect yourself in the hospital is to develop a culture amongst your team where you point out flaws in each other's behavior. You know, if you see one of your colleagues touching their face when they shouldn't, or if you see someone that's not being mindful of their PPE, or if you see someone who's, you know, not being deliberate 
in the way they're washing their hands, point it out and create a culture where that's a friendly reminder and something that's welcome. So N95 masks. Is an N95 mask required all the time while in the hospital? You know, I think to answer this question, what you have to do is really think about where are we as a healthcare delivery system? And I think what we know is that, you know, there are many models of how this disease is going to progress. And, a, you know, a wise physicist once said, all models are incorrect, some are useful. I don't think anyone really feels that we're at the peak of what's happening. And N95 masks are a scarce resource. So, you know, the answer to this question is, is definitely no at this time. N95 masks need to be reserved and conserved for high-risk environments, and in particular, for aerosol-generating procedures. And, you know, those are things like intubation, the use of BiPAP, and, you know, surgical masks are, I think, your best layer of protection in addition to the things Sergio outlined. So piggybacking off that, what is sound doing to address PPE shortages? Really a couple of things. I think the first is something Mark already touched on, which is we're doing our best to provide up-to-date and actionable information on best practices to use PPE to protect yourself, to protect your family, and to protect your patient. And how can we conserve these scarce resources and do the most good for the greatest number? And to that end, we've purchased our own supply of N95 masks. And there's um, a link now in OWL on our COVID page, which you'll see with the red arrow, the bottom left of the screen, where your chief or your RMD can request PPE. Right now, the only PPE item that we have in stock and ready for delivery, and we've, we've actually already shipped you know, a fair number is N95 mask. The version that we have is a KN95 mask. And again, we're really reserving these for environments where people are exposed to respiratory aerosols. We're working on a procuring surgical masks and should have, you know, news on an ETA for those in the coming days. So if you're at a site that's experiencing critical PPE shortages, and in particular, if you're exposed to respiratory aerosols, if you're doing intubations and you need help, reach out to us. We're, that's, we're here to support you. Thanks, Nate. Uh, I think a lot of this is also making sure that we're working with our, our site level leadership uh, in evaluating what practices are going on or what has historically occurred at a site, uh, and uh, also what uh, many of our clinicians are being asked to do now. And so if there's updates with respect to the clinical practices at your site, especially with respect to high-risk aerosolizing procedures, please make sure that that's, uh, we're made aware of that. Uh, so that way, as we are trying to uh, identify sites that uh, have the greatest need, um, and are in the highest risk situations that we're allocating those, uh, those masks to them. Uh, the next question obviously is what are quarantine best practices? Sorry, go back please. Uh, what are quarantine best practices in the event of an exposure? The three things that really need to be considered here uh, are first off the status of the patient based on testing, so COVID positive, versus a patient under investigation or PUI. Uh, the second really has to do with uh, what Sergio mentioned earlier about source control. So does the patient uh, his or, uh, have his or her mouth and nose covered with an appropriate mask? So does the patient have source control? Uh, and lastly is what is the status of um, PPE, specifically masks, uh, in lower risk situations, and then full PPE, mask, goggles, and uh, or uh, gowns with respect to uh, what the exposure is. Those are the first three things that you want to consider. Uh, again, COVID status, whether or not there is source control, and what's the status of uh, being masked for the individual uh, clinician. Then we would get into what 
are the concerns about whether or not the pay, uh, whether or not the exposure level was uh, high or low. Uh, to be clear, what Nate outlined with respect to high risk procedures are what the CDC defines as high risk procedures. So high risk uh, for aerosolizing of droplets, uh, specifically intubations, nebulizer treatments, uh, non-invasive positive, uh, positive pressure ventilation or BiPAP, those particular situations. Other things that are considered moderate risk include uh, extended contact with a patient um, without any evidence of um, PPE. So uh, what that would certainly from the hospital medicine, but I think for all of specialties, it would be walking in uh, with a patient with no mask uh, and no gloves at all. We are gonna be providing um, further details uh, that will go out to uh, site level leadership about quarantine best practices. But the, the real thought here is if you have a COVID positive patient and you've got high or moderate risk based on the level of source uh, control and based on whether or not you're masking, um, then we will start considering uh, quarantine for 14 days. It's again, 14 days from the time of exposure. So obviously there are many instances where we're uh, entering patient rooms, finding out later that the patient has turned positive and then recollecting whether or not um, uh, we're proceeding with uh, a quarantine or not. Uh, also it has to be considered um, whether or not people are uh, having symptoms. So in the lower risk or whether or not you have a mask or their source control, you really want to make sure that we're considering um, the, the symptomatology that is going on with this because in many instances, uh, the CDC recommendations are that people can continue to work and see patients as long as they're maintaining uh, their own uh, gowning, gloving, uh, hand washing, um, and then self-monitoring. Uh, a lot of this is complicated. We wanna make sure that there's clarity. Uh, we're continuing to evaluate the CDC recommendations. We are gonna be pushing something out in the next couple of days to make sure that there's clarity and that we, we are assisting with our health systems and guiding them um, to what uh, best clinical practice is with respect to quarantine. Does Fount have specific guidance for providers who are pregnant or over the age 65? What about other high-risk groups? So I think that it, it's very important to emphasize that Sound Physicians has two priorities. Number one is the safety of our clinicians, and number two is providing the greatest value healthcare for our communities and the patients that we serve. And I think that it, never in our history have both of those it, been so important and so relevant to the circumstances that we're living. In terms of higher risk uh, providers or higher risk groups, there are three groups I wanted to address and just share with you uh, our thoughts. Number one is like uh, people who are actively immunosuppressed. And uh, these are considered by many the highest risk in terms of not only contracting the disease, but in terms of having poor outcomes from this disease. And I think that very clear examples of this would be uh, clinicians uh, that work with us or in other teams that have uh, are recipients of organ transplants who are actively immunosuppressed at very high levels. I think that the general consensus from their clinicians and from us has been that those clinicians should not be at the bedside in, in times like this. I think that uh, um, that would be the highest uh, risk group. In terms of age, uh, the data that keeps emerging, I think, has clearly pointed out that there is a differential in terms of overall mortality risk uh, when you look at uh, age groups, and that as patients uh, or people get older, there is a higher risk of death uh, associated with COVID-19, and that can be associated with many other uh, co comorbid factors, but also related to age directly. I think that um, in general, our, uh, our workforce is a very young uh, workforce, but I do think that for those clinicians who are at a higher risk, uh, having conversations with their local leadership, trying to identify ways that they can still work, 
or try to minimize the, the risk is, I mean, what's recommended at this point, and that's what the CDC is recommending. And finally, I think that there's a lot of questions about pregnancy. There is no clear data on the on a higher incidence of COVID-19 infection in pregnant patients or of a worse outcome in uh, with COVID-19 in pregnant patients. And I think that this is always obviously a concern. And again, I would I, I, I would refer people to talk with their local leaders and try to identify what are the best ways for them to, to be able to fulfill their duties and help us out in, in this time. But I do think that it's important to acknowledge that there are some things that we do know in terms of higher risk and there are things that are still unknown but the cdc has a lot of statements regarding these and we're obviously aligned with those statements and trying to do what's best for our clinicians and trying to make a difference in this in our communities with what's going on also with our patients testing is something that has been you know, on the minds of all of us, and obviously a big uh, contributor to um, difficulty in knowing which patients to cohort and, you know, who has the disease and who doesn't is timely availability of test results. And, we, you know, we've discussed before on this webinar, the commonly available PCR test, which amplifies RNA fragments from the virus. And I think it's important that we, we all have a good understanding of the test characteristics. And, you know, the really, there's two really important points. And, and really the fundamental one is that a single negative swab does not have the power to rule out disease. And, you know, current data suggests that while it's very specific, meaning it's positive in the presence of disease, the sensitivity for, you know, a nasopharyngeal swab is you know, the best available evidence suggests that that's around 70%. So what that means is that as the prevalence of disease and as the pretest probability of the patient increases, the negative predictive value or the ability of a single swab to rule out COVID-19 declines. And we all need to make sure that we use the clinical picture or the disease phenotype when making clinical decisions. And in particular, if you're working in a unit where COVID-19 patients are cohorted, it would not be appropriate to de-escalate precautions based on a single negative swab. And I think it's also worth emphasizing that, you know, we there are more testing op you know, options that are going to have improved turnaround time that are going to become available and, and some widely available through the FDA's emergency use exemption um, in the coming weeks. And many of those are going to share these same uh, test characteristics. So, you know, we're we're gonna send out some organization-wide communication on the characteristics of this test, but I think understanding the lack of negative predictive value and what that means for caring for patients. And if you're in a high prevalence community where there's widespread outbreak and you see a patient with bilateral lung infiltrates that's hypoxic and you have a rapid turnaround test, if that test is negative, it definitely does not mean that they don't have the disease. When is a chest CT indicated for COVID-19? I think this is a very frequent question, and I think it arises from several observations or facts. Number one is that, uh, like Nate said, the current uh, PCR testing has limitations in terms of its uh, negative predictive value, but also in terms of its availability in many places, whereas uh, there's been um, clearly defined findings on the CT scan that are consistent with COVID-19 and especially uh, and today when you see these findings uh, the pretest probability of it being COVID-19 is extremely high. This has also been supported by one particular um, publication uh, from the Chinese experience in Lancet that suggested that it might even have a higher negative predictive value and positive predictive value than some of the PCR tests. H having said that, I think that what people have learned, and this is something that has been shared, I mean, both in the Seattle experience, the New York experience, and the European experience, is that it doesn't really change your management in terms of getting a CT scan. It definitely, for COVID, it also might tie up your CT scan and might expose other patients and people to a patient who might have COVID-19. So the, down, the downside might be a little bit higher than the upside, 
having said that, I think that the best answer we can give to this question is that you should get a CT scan when it might help you with your differential or it might help you find something else or rule something else other than COVID-19. That is the role for the CT scan, both in the ED and in the hospital. I do think that um, if you're looking for specific things that are alternative diagnosis, it can be very helpful. On the other hand, I think that if you're just trying to confirm your hunch that this could be COVID-19, it's probably not gonna change your management. And like I said, it, it probably wouldn't be indicated, especially once you start having a large number of cases. What is appropriate supportive care for COVID-19? And I think that this is a, a very important question because ultimately I've seen a lot of emphasis both in the press, but also in discussions with colleagues around the country, in social media, about all these magic bullets and specific treatments. But the bottom line is those who have survived COVID so far, uh, whether it been hospitalization, outpatient treatment, or ICU treatment, probably have survived thanks to supportive care. So what do we define as appropriate supportive care? I think that there's three things that are very important in terms of, uh, uh, of COVID basic ABCs that everybody should be considering for those hospitalized patients, especially in the sicker patients. Number one is, uh, as we are defining uh, these patients with a severe acute respiratory illness of unknown origin initially, empiric antibiotics are highly recommended. And I think that is something that everybody should start uh, treating them for potential pneumonias or super infections early on. I think that number two would be appropriate fluid management. In those patients who have shock, which are a smaller percent of these patients, appropriate hemodynamic support, obviously, with uh, a crystalloids, balanced crystalloids if possible, and vasopressors where indicated is gonna be very important. But for the vast majority of these patients where the main issues are respiratory, what's recommended is a conservative fluid management approach. So not um, giving these patients large amounts of IV fluids that they don't need and that might help with oxygenation. And number three, in terms of supportive therapy, is really our support with respiratory and oxygen therapy. And I think that as a general goal, we should keep the SATs with oxygen between 90 and 96% for all patients. For those who are pregnant, maybe a little bit higher than the lower end, 92, 94. But really the idea is that we use the least amount of oxygen to keep them at that level. Um, there has been a lot of concerns of escalating oxygen deliveries to non-invasive with BiPAP and aerosol, uh, aerosolization of droplets. There seems to be growing um, consensus from, from experts that probably high flow nasal cannula would be a, the next step up and especially in younger patients might be a good way to, 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 to treat them and avoid uh, maybe the need for intubation. And then finally, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about these patients having failure with some of these non-invasive ventilation uh, strategies and that we probably should be very um, proactive in terms of mechanical ventilation and intubation. Once they're mechanically ventilated, the important things are to remember that our goal is to uh, protect their lungs from ARDS. So use a low tidal volume, which is usually recommended from six to eight, um, from four, uh, for, yeah, six, four to eight, uh, CCs or ML per predicted body weight kilo, uh, predicted body weight kilograms. So really use a lower tidal volumes. Again, use oxygen and PEEP as uh, needed appropriately. And <clears throat> for those most severe cases, what has been recommended in order of use and evidence has been to use a prone position ventilation uh, for those who have severe ARDS. Escalating that sometimes to neuromuscular blockers for patients who have ventilator dyssynchrony. And in a very, very small and selected group, patients uh, might receive ECMO. That is something that's available at your center. But I think that for the vast majority of the patients that we will see, focusing on the empiric antibiotics, appropriate fluid management, which would be conservative, and delivering early and adequate oxygen therapy should really be the mainstay of our supportive care. So the next question that we had received a number 
uh, of solicitations on was about uh, criteria for dedicated COVID-19 units. Um, and as we thought about this, this is pretty complicated because it's a little different for each of our specialties. Um, our emergency medicine colleagues are actually looking at dedicated um, screening um, facilities. So, you know, take for instance, uh, for instance, uh, what's going on in Arizona at Carondelet, where uh, a number of patients are being screened outside of the hospital um, in tents that have been set up um, and uh, for critical care. Um, looking to provide some additional support um, via uh, tele-ICU. Um, so uh, criteria for dedicated unit can mean a lot of different things. For the hospital medicine, where I think this question originated, um, the question came up about uh, seeing some information that was shared um, via the Society of Hospital Medicine about some academic centers and their approach with respect to COVID-19 units, um, specifically in terms of uh, isolating the patients, limiting the number of uh, clinical nursing staff and pharmacy staff that were serving uh, these patients, uh, and then obviously limiting the number of um, uh, hospitalists that were seeing these patients as well, um, with very specific criteria on um, who was cared for them, and whether they were actually um, patients under investigation or um, all COVID positive, and what the testing regimen are. Um, with this being a, a pretty non-specific question and adding uh, and and trying to get appropriate detail around answering it, um, my suggestion is making sure that these requests are escalated um, to a regional leadership. Uh, I know, uh, for instance, we are actually um, beginning to set up um, almost COVID-specific facilities in partnership with a number of systems. Uh, and individuals looking for ways to be able to approach this. But this question is really based on um, what your specific locale is. Uh, again, looking at our post-acute colleagues, um, some of our post-acute facilities have uh, per CDC recommendations isolated uh, the nursing staff uh, and focused on telemedicine or telesniff uh, practices to make sure that uh, these patients are appropriately cared for and not uh, transferred to the emergency department unnecessarily if they can be treated and uh, receive supportive care within those facilities. So um, without avoiding the question, since it was asked a number of times, I would strongly recommend turning to local leadership, identifying what uh, is and isn't available in terms of an inventory at the, uh, at the site level, um, and creating some visibility. Uh, I know some of the additional questions that came in are, do you staff it differently in terms of volumes? And based on some of the information that was received from the academic facilities, those numbers are historically much smaller and lower in terms of volume than what are seen in private practice hospital settings. Uh, and so I, I know it was specific to that question uh, that's probably not the way that Sound would be running a, a dedicated hospital medicine COVID unit. Um, but again, uh, too many details to answer um, specifically here and ask that, again, those get escalated because we can provide some additional guidance with respect to what service line and what particular environment that the patients are in. Another uh, very popular question that's come up, is there an opportunity to do telemedicine from home? Uh, I think I wanna split this out into two particular um, uh, thought patterns because uh, telemedicine is very specific. And I know that we also sent out a communication with respect to technology assisted visits. Um, the opportunity to do telemedicine, um, I think is, uh, uh, available in all three uh, service lines. Uh, and I say all three service lines, um, I'm including post-acute in the hospital medicine um, realm. And the short answer to that is yes, we, uh, you know, 18 months ago made sure that we uh, had leveraged uh, or uh, invested heavily in terms of uh, setting up a, a telemedicine presence. Um, we have a number of telemedicine um, our telesniff opportunities that we're being asked to do, and that's increased with the desire to make sure that those patients can be cared for in the skilled nursing um, space. We are utilizing telemedicine to support our number of our hospitalist practices, 
uh, as of, and Nate can correct me, but I believe as of this, uh, either yesterday or this morning, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services has now freed up, uh, uh, created additional flexibility with respect to doing telemedicine for the emergency department. And then um, our uh, critical care colleagues are also doing telemedicine there. So the short answer to that is, is there an opportunity to do that? Yes, it will likely be supporting a facility that may not be your own, but I can reassure you that regional leadership um, as well as service line leadership is doing everything we can to identify where critical needs are. Um, so obviously for uh, New York, New Jersey area and Louisiana in terms of considering our opportunities to increase uh, our capacity uh, and maintain appropriate volumes for clinicians by utilizing telemedicine. For the technology assisted visits, sorry, um, for the technology assisted visits, that is something that, uh, again, because CMS created uh, some additional flexibility to minimize uh, direct contact with um, COVID-19 patients or, uh, in some instances, patients under investigation, uh, that is being utilized, and we're encouraging that, particularly in um, recognizing that not all sites have uh, a full complement of uh, PPE and may be in contingency or crisis capacity modes where they are limiting, uh, severely limiting um, clinician access to PPE. So refer to some of the memos if there are uh, desires to help out in terms of what is being done in the skilled nursing space or um, away from your own individual site, please make sure that your local leadership is aware uh, because quite honestly, this is gonna be a growing need. Um, and we wanna make sure that again, we're providing support for as many of our, our programs and uh, as many hospitals as possible to support uh, these patients and, and treat them. What about splitting ventilators? So this is something I think that has received a lot of attention based on social media postings of ideas of using one ventilator for two or more patients. It's also received some obvious um, play on the news because it, I think it, it goes to the crux of one of the biggest fears is that we won't have enough resources to support all these patients. The reality is that nobody has ever used a ventilator in a situation like this for more than one patient. So there is zero clinical evidence that it would be helpful or that it could be harmful. And both are, I think, equally potential. Now, there are, on one hand, there are uh, some consensus um, statements, which really are more like a, from a, a series of societies saying, this is a bad idea and this is why. But there's also been some very serious uh, thought put into some protocols, both by uh, Columbia Presbyterian in, in New York and by a group in Belgium of really trying to do this. If we had to do this, how we would do it. The bottom line is, I think that we have no clinical data to suggest that this would be helpful. There is clearly potential for this to be harmful. And I think that the, the reality is that we just don't know. But I would say that for the vast, vast majority of sound physicians, programs. This is probably something that I don't anticipate we will be utilizing um, unless a data emerges and protocols emerge to suggest that this really can make a difference. Next slide. This goes along the, the same line of um, anxiety to do something in a situation that is obviously overwhelming. I think uh, there's a lot of drugs and I'll go through them one by one that have been either proposed by uh, the, pre the press, leadership as potential cures or miracle drugs that could really be game changers. I think it's very important to emphasize that both WHO, CDC, and every scientific society has been very clear that as of today, there is no specific treatment that has proven to be effective in COVID-19. 
Now, what are the drugs that people have considered and why? So one of the ones that has received the most press in general is the hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin combination. This is based on in vitro studies that show that chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine can inhibit the growth of viruses in vitro. A, a caveat to that is that that same inhibition has been shown in other viruses, and when they've actually applied them in clinical trials, it didn't work. So there's nothing special about something that in, in vitro might inhibit growth in terms of making it a, a game changer immediately. There's also been some very small clinical trials, specifically one from Marcel, uh, France, which is very limited, has a lot of uh, limitations and flaws that people have uh, used as almost like a proof that we should be given hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin to all patients. Now, the reality is nobody knows. There are some clinical trials that are ongoing. I hope that those clinical trials can give us information. Uh, this is the time to do the clinical trials because this is the time that we can get the patients. So I think that uh, as clinicians, it would be of a greater service to the community if we can enroll our patients in these clinical trials as opposed to using these drugs off-label. Now, clinicians have the ability and have always had the ability uh, by the FDA to use certain drugs off-label if they're approved for other, for other instances. But I think that we have to be very cautious in a situation uh, of a pandemic because uh, A, using drugs that don't benefit people uh, in large numbers might rob people who actually could use those drugs from having them accessible. And B, which is a, a, big, a bigger worry I have, is that even small potential for harm when you give it to thousands of patients can just magnify the overall harm we're producing to a scale that would be very, very difficult to swallow. And along those lines, it has been commonly stated that these are well-tolerated drugs. That is true in people who are relatively healthy. We don't know how well-tolerated they are in people who are critically ill, but one of the very well-described uh, side effects is prolongation of QT. And there are a vast number of reports that are both suggesting that these patients can develop cardiomyopathy, like a viral cardiomyopathy, but also a growing number of reports of these patients having ventricular tachycardias. So again, I mean, if we're just giving a drug that all it does is increases the risk of having ventricular tachycardia, and we're doing that by the thousands, we could cause a lot of harm. So I would urge more, more caution. Uh, hopefully the data will come, but I think that uh, our, in a situation like this, we should not, our first goal is not to do more harm. And I, I guess it would be great if these drugs work, but we just don't know. The other drugs that have received a lot of press and, and discussion are remdesivir, which is a broad spectrum antiviral that was developed for Ebola. Some sick patients and some of our sound patients actually received remdesivir on a compassionate basis. It, now I think that channel has been closed and you can get remdesivir for your patients through three randomized clinical trials, two sponsored by the a manufacturer and one sponsored by the NIH. I know that we do have some of our programs within Sound that are participating, but that's the way to try to figure out if this drug would be helpful or not for the most crit critically ill patients. There's also been a lot of talk about lopinavir and ritovirin, which is Calatra, a drug utilized vastly for HIV. And that uh, got a lot of steam early on uh, based on Chinese experience and suggestions. There's one study that has been completed and published in the New England Journal of Medicine with over 200 patients that showed no benefit. So I think that at this point, this is a drug that's been studied the best and it seems to be no benefit. So I think that people are not utilizing it. The other two interventions that I think are also being talked about a lot, especially for the sickest um, spectrum of patients is the use of IL-6. And uh, that is something that is undergoing trials right now. I think it should be done mostly as an experimental um, phase and it should be done in the sickest patients within the confines of a trial. And again, we have looked at similar compounds in the past for septic shock and it didn't really work. They become very useful in rheumatoid arthritis, but the idea for COVID-19 I think is still research. We, we don't really know if they work or not. And the last thing that you might have heard recently 
uh, that I think was approved by the FDA, and this is for experimental use, is the use of uh, convalescent plasma. So the idea that you would take the plasma of patients who have recovered and use those antibodies to treat the sickest patients with COVID-19. There are some institutions who are initiating protocols for that research. Again, I don't think this is something that you're gonna have vastly available throughout our hospitals. But again, if, it, if, it, if, if it's studied appropriately and we can get an answer quickly, it could be something that potentially could work, but it also could be something that potentially doesn't work. So I think that what I'm urging is the uh, a caution in terms of understanding that everything we do will distract us from something else that we need to be doing and that everything that we do can have harm as well. And that harm can be potentiated significantly. This is the time to do the trials. COVID-19 is likely not gonna disappear as people have mentioned. So this is the time to try to get patients enrolled so that we can actually have more definitive data of what works and what doesn't work. But I do think that we have to be very careful with the, the attitude of what do we have to lose? Because there is a lot that we have to lose. And I think as clinicians and as um, stewards of high value care, we should think about this as well. I think the, the last question or one of the other questions is about what's the latest information on co-infection. It's been asked a number of times um, and uh, there's still limited information uh, that exists out there um, with respect to this. Um, two specific studies, one of which is um, co-infection with uh, mycoplasma um, that uh, has been associated with the pneumonia um, and I think is part of the reason why uh, a lot of individuals are looking at the hydrochloroquine uh, azithromycin um, with uh, some level of uh, reasoning behind how we would uh, go about treating uh, this particular condition or COVID with uh, mycoplasma. Uh, I think the real basis for this um, is whether or not uh, COVID-19 is being uh, associated with rhinovirus um, or uh, influenza or other uh, items there. There is a, a study or at least a report um, out that does indicate that there can be uh, co-infection with these. Uh, the report that I recall is it's a little over 3% of cases where um, this is uh, being associated, uh, where COVID and another virus, um, upper respiratory virus is associated um, there weren't any conclusions that came out of that particular study uh, other than, yes, it's possible that they can coexist uh, and does it affect your treatment regimen um, one way or another. There weren't any particular conclusions that came out um, with respect to that. Uh, but there are more reports that are coming out uh, that are addressing this. The, the ultimate question is uh, getting back, I think, to what was discussed earlier by Nate with respect to um, looking at the clinical phenotype and uh, figuring out whether or not um, the uh, additional infection uh, merits uh, a treatment, uh, a change in uh, treatment of the patient versus um, looking at the clinical phenotype, having a high level of suspicion and treating uh, going forward. Uh, I think uh, for th those who are asking the question in terms of if they test positive for influenza, does that mean that you stop um, your evaluation for COVID-19? I think that again comes back to clinical phenotype and whether or not it's going to materially change how you're treating the patient um, based on the clinical information that you have for that individual patient. Okay, thank you guys. Before we move into the live Q&A, just very quickly, I just want to kind of wrap up that question about how a sound is supporting frontline clinicians or remind everybody about a couple of important resources. One is the new peer support program, which is up and running. And um, if you had a difficult um, experience with something that is related to patient care, or if you have a colleague who has had a difficult experience and is struggling with that, they can call and end up speaking with a sound clinician, a colleague who has received some special training in this. 
uh, we'll include all of these phone numbers and links in the follow-up message. And then the employee assistance program is for anything. It doesn't have to be patient care related. Anybody can call these numbers and speak with a counselor, potentially up to three counseling sessions. Last thing here, if you have questions that possibly human resources could address, HR at soundphysicians.com is the, the people support department. Okay, let's move into the live Q&A. And I'm gonna challenge all of us to answer some of the questions um, as, as quickly as possible. If there's a one word answer or a one sentence answer, then um, that, that should suffice because there's a lot of really fantastic questions here. So first one, do we need to wear face shields in all of our PUI or COVID-19 positive patients? Yes. Okay. Next question is related to that. Are other hospital physicians being required to reuse N95s with cloth masks as a cover? Are other hospital physicians being required to reuse capper face shields with cleaning them? I feel it's dangerous for physicians, but worse for patient safety since they are then exposed. Yes, on both so, counts. And the idea behind you know the mask over the N95 is a uh, CDC approved N95 sparing tactic. You know, cleaning and procedures for reuse of PAPRs and how often does the HEPA filter in the waste pack need to be changed will vary with the model of PAPR that you have. So that's a you know a difficult question to give a one word answer to. You know, I'll just throw in there that last week on SHM's webinar about PPE, one of the largest health systems in New York. Uh, is using a strategy to reuse N N95s in this fashion with a surgical mask over the N95. Next question, should individuals who take NSAIDs long-term discontinue their use? So there, there is no uh, data to support that, and uh, similar questions have been asked about other drugs such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and the best recommendation is that if you are taking a drug for an indication that that it helps, that you shouldn't stop taking it right now. Okay. There was a small study that suggested viral shedding may be prolonged. When should we release transmission-based precautions for COVID-positive patients? And is this study going to impact these recommendations? So that the study of viral shedding has not impacted that recommendation. A viral shedding does not equate to the transmission and contagion. We don't know, I mean, what it really means at this point. I think that there's two points I want to make, and I know Greg uh, talked about this also and will be in the communication that's coming out today. There's, there's two important distinctions, I think, for our clinicians. One is a discharge from the hospital or from the ED. And for those, you don't need to have a, a negative test or you don't need to have the ability to, to, to restrict uh, infection control. You discharge patients from the ED or from the hospital based on um, clinical criteria uh, where they need to be hospitalized or, or, or meet outpatient criteria. In terms of when can you discontinue quarantine for outpatients or discontinue um, precautions in the hospital for those who are hospitalized, the current recommendation is you must have two of the two negative COVID tests that are 24 hours uh, or more apart. Okay, great. Can we be reassured if we only see unilateral pneumonia? No. Okay, question regarding pregnant colleagues. We addressed this a little bit before, but this more specifically has to do with sort of operationally. Um, is anyone aware of any adjustments to workflows for pregnant colleagues to avoid exposure? They, the answer to that is those are being locally determined. And uh, I do believe that some considerations are being made um, at the site level, but that's based on knowledge of what can be done at the site and what options exist. Can you comment about the use of ACE and ARB use in COVID-19 patients? Uh, 
So as I mentioned, I think there's been a lot of speculation about potential uh, pathways that could suggest that these pa patients who take ACE, and AR ACE inhibitors or ARBs could, could be at higher risk. There's also some suggestions that actually it could be protective. The bottom line is nobody really knows. People have suggested that we should investigate this, but the current stance from the American Heart Association and from the European Council for Heart Failure and for Hypertension is very clear that patients who take ACE inhibitors or ARBs for cardiac uh, indications should continue to take them. That is greater, that definitely confidence that there's greater benefit uh, than any risk. And in those patients who get hospitalized, you would manage the ACE and the ARB in the same way you would manage it if they got hospitalized for something else. So for example, somebody comes in with acute kidney injury or is hypotensive, hypotensive with COVID-19, you obviously would hold these, but you would do that for a pneumonia as well. Okay, awesome. This question relates a little bit to the N95 conversation before, but should, should N95 masks that are used in COVID-19 positive rooms where a high-risk procedure has been performed, can those be cleaned and reused and or just re reused? There's some a lot of data on reutilization of N95 masks with techniques that vary from you know UV light to hydrogen peroxide sterilization. And you know I, I think that if you're going to use a, a reuse um, you know workflow in your institution that needs to be guided by your infection control and what you have available. I think the reality is that many clinicians will be reusing N95 masks in the near term due to supply constraints. Do, Nate, do I take that to mean that if you didn't have access to anything else, would you keep using it? Yes. And that's why okay. using the surgical mask over the N95, the idea being that you entrain, you know, respiratory aerosol and droplet particles on the outside of the mask when you inhale. So if you use a surgical mask over the top of the N95, you mitigate that, and then you discard the surgical mask, thereby, you know, keeping the N95 as free from contamination as possible. Okay. Um, Question, or here's a, a follow-up question related to the unilateral pneumonia. So the, the, the setting for that question was a post-acute post setting, um, and they're having difficulty obtaining tests for COVID. So if we are seeing unilateral pneumonia, fever, cough, shortness of breath, we've been told to treat the pneumonia. So should they also be testing for COVID or pushing for testing for COVID? I think that as a as the incidence increases, it is very likely that those patients are higher likelihood that they could have COVID. And I think that um, at the beginning of uh, the, pandem the pandemic, a lot of people felt that, okay, if you have a, an alternate diagnosis um, that's solid, you don't need to worry about COVID. But as the prevalence increases, I think people have found, like Greg said, that the co-infection is not zero. So I think that, yes, I would, I would, I would still test it depending on what's going on in your community. Okay, and what would you recommend? So if somebody's having trouble convincing their their SNF staff, anybody have any administrative recommendations on how to address that? I think that just, I mean, sharing the data of other places, and I think it also relates a lot to what's going on in the community. If the community has very low prevalence of COVID-19, it's probably less likely. But if the numbers are increasing, I think that all it takes is for one patient to have no suspicion of COVID and test positive for everybody to realize that that's a real potential. And, and, I, and I think in the face of limited testing, what you can do or make the recommendations um, that the CDC had with respect to post-acute units and um, whether or not the, there can be limitation and getting back to the original point of treating the patient um, uh, according to what you see, um, and not necessarily depending on the test, simply because test availability is still nowhere near what it needs to be right now. Okay. Question about um, in contagion, I guess, after 
COVID diagnosis. If an inpatient has COVID and needs an urgent but not emergent procedure prior to discharge, should we advise that it be done seven days after symptoms resolved or seven days after the last fever or some other recommendation? Well, I think that there's no real clinical guidance that can define that for sure. But I do believe that the current um, feeling is that we shouldn't be doing like non-emergent surgeries in general. So I think that's one consideration that's unrelated to the patient. And non-emergent surgery includes inpatients and outpatients. Um, I think that probably what would be best is like treated like any other infection. And ideally, you would want them to be recovered from the infection in order to get their surgery. <clears throat> What's the best way to protect myself and staff if we also work in an outpatient setting? I think it gets back to um, what you can do with respect to the basics of hand washing and social distancing within those particular environments. I would also be um, recommending that it's you know, limiting the number of uh, instances where um, you can potentially expose uh, not only other staff, but um, other individuals um, in terms of, you, you know, community or your own um, hospital uh, as, as potential contaminants. So I, I would be recommending, um, again, the hand washing, gloving when necessary, and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and, and masks is appropriate based on the, the environment that you're you're in. But obviously, if you have exposure or you think that you're going to be in a high risk in, um, instance, I would be avoiding going into those uh, environments at all, at least for the, the short term. If you're um, in a if you're in an environment where you have a moderate or uh, high risk uh, exposure scenario. Okay. Is there a difference between the N95 and KN95 masks? There are differences. There's a document on the 3M website, which is quite useful and compares the characteristics of all of them. And due to supply constraints, you know, there will be masks that were, you know, initially designed for industrial use that have the same filtering capacity that will be utilized in the healthcare space. And, you know, I, I think what is very clear is that a KN95 mask is better than a surgical mask if you're exposed to respiratory aerosol. Okay, Nate, this might be another one for you. Have any of our sites received assistance or relief from the strategic national stockpile for masks, gloves, et cetera? We have sites in New York that have had masks allocated, but I'm not aware of any that have been received. Okay. Um, what are the prevailing theories regarding the relatively low mortality rate in the U.S. given the high number of cases? I'll take that one. I think that the, um, the mortality obviously has a lot to do also with the number of tests done. And uh, what we've learned is that the, the larger number of tests you do in, in the population per capita, the lower the mortality has overall been. There's been a, today, I mean, there was a release uh, on, on Lancet of a very nice study that looked actually with a very specific methodology of what the real uh, case fatality rate is probably for this worldwide. And it clearly is higher than the flu for sure, but I think it's lower than what most people are seeing uh, on some of the websites based on just uh, the reported cases, because those are especially in places where there is a limited testing done mostly on the people who are hospitalized or, or, or present with symptoms. But I think that it's too early to really uh, make any comments on the, on the mortality in the United States. I think it's important for us to keep pushing for social distancing in our communities uh, in terms of trying to flatten that curve because in places where the mortality has been exceedingly high, like in Italy, it also could be in great part contribu uh, contrib contributed by the fact that the, the system collapsed. And uh, that definitely, I mean, obviously for obvious reasons, could raise the number of people who, who die. Awesome, thank you, Sergio. So we're at five minutes after the hour. Uh, guys, any closing comments? 
Um, Thank I you. I think reiterating, Nate, we always do the same thing. It's always fun. Um, <laughs> we, uh, at first, I just reiterate the thanks and gratitude um, that we continue to, to share with you all um, and reiterate, please keep sending in questions. Uh, they, they are driving content, not just for this call, but for the specialty specific calls as well. And I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for all you do. I know that, you know, many of you spent Doctor's Day yesterday in PPE at the bedside, and you know, we're doing our utmost to support you. And I would encourage you, as we've um, said before, if there's anything that we can do to support you, you let us know and we'll try and make it happen. Sergio? I agree. I, I just want to echo what uh, Greg and Nate said. Thank you. Thank you, really, for all the hard work for all we're doing in our communities, for all we're doing for our patients. I think that there's still obviously a lot for us to, 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 to do and not forget, I mean, that uh, not only, I mean, at the bedside, our patients, but the people who work in the hospital and our friends and our communities are looking at us for guidance and for calmness. And I think that's uh, something that we all should, should keep working on. Thank you very much to our, our expert CMO panel. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, I'll just second everything that, that they just said. You're doing a fantastic job, and we'll look forward to talking to you again next week. Have a good day.